So from Gerard, now let me move to my second founding person, Roger Williams. Now you see him there in 1957. He was a, a chemist, biochemist of great esteem. Actually, the, the, the discoverer of panathenic acid, the discoverer of biotin, one of the co-discoverers of folic acid. So this guy has pretty good credentials. Published over 300 articles and was the president of the American Chemical Society in 1957, the most esteemed you know, kind of uh, association of chemists in the United States. So what did he believe? He believed that this individuality concept of Gerard was so important that it could describe why people got illnesses for which you couldn't find the bug that caused it. And he produced a concept called genetotropic disease. Now this is a core concept that I don't believe is taught like it should be in all of our academic institutions. It's a profound concept published in The Lancet for the first time in 1949. Genetotropic disease. What does that mean? Genetotropic disease is a disease that occurs as a consequence of the genetic uniqueness of the person not getting adequate nutrients to meet their needs so their metabolism is less functional than it should be that produces the outcome called a dysfunction, which we later call a disease. So he would say chronic diseases are a manifestation of genetotropic imbalances. Now, I had the privilege of knowing Dr. Williams at the latter portion of his life, and I had a conversation with him once, and I said, um, why is it that there's this big controversy about this concept? It seems so obvious and so real. And he said, well, Jeff, how do we teach nutrition? How do we teach health sciences to ultimate practitioners? We teach it as the law of the averages. Have you ever heard the 70 kilogram statistical human? Of the data that we present as clinical examples to people comes from this mythic average human being that's in the midline of some Gaussian distribution curve of characteristics. And he says, if we look at nutrition, Nutrition is for real people. Statistical humans are of little interest. That was a quote. Now that's a profoundly simple sound like that's a haiku, because from that you can build a whole curriculum, can't you? And that curriculum will differ from that of a traditional 70 kilogram human curriculum, and it'll lead you to different questions to ask that patient when you're doing your knee to knee with them, and it'll lead to different conclusions about outcome. And it maps against Archibald Garrod's biochemical individuality, doesn't it? So Williams, you know, later, I, at the end of his life, and he uh, passed away at uh, 93. By the way, it's interesting, all of these people I'm talking about died in their 90s. And when I talked to him in the later parts of his life, about in the, in the late, seven, late 80s, um, I said, Dr. Williams, you know, what do your critics say about your ideas today. I mean, you've been advancing these concepts for 50 years. And he said, well, none of my critics are alive. <laughs> you know, proof of the pudding is, I'm still here to talk about it. Those guys are all gone, you know. If you're a non-believer, take the, take the rap at the end of the, end of the page, you know. So here's his article in 1950 in The Lancet, the uh, concept of genetic tropic diseases, based on essentially upon recent findings in genetics and biochemistry, which have not been incorporated in the medical thought. Now that was 1950. Let me ask you the question today, it's 2009, how well have the recent findings in genetics and biochemistry been incorporated into medical thought today? Still, we're, we're, it's got a lot of room to go here some, you know, 69 years later. The concept of genetic tropic disease may lead to an understanding of many diseases whose etiology was obscure, but I think still is obscure until you start looking at this model. And then he goes on in nutrition reviews and he says a genetic tropic disease is one which occurs if a diet fails to provide a sufficient supply of one or more nutrients required at high levels because of the characteristic genetic pattern of the individual, right? Patterning. So the food of one is a poison of another. Everybody in our field knows that. So you say a person, wheat might be a good food for a lot, but for a person with gluten neuropathy, that's not a good idea. So you can't make a rule that covers everybody. You've got to look at the rule applied to that individual. And I was very fortunate, I was asked to write the foreword for a reprint of his classic book, Biochemical Individuality, which was a, a great privilege when this book was reprinted a few years ago, uh, to kind of talk about what's happened in the field in the 20 years since 1987 and, uh, and, and this concept.
concept of biochemical individuality. Now, this is a book that Dr. Williams authored that's not well known or as well known. And I, I don't want to challenge you by asking in your, in your course if you had a chance to see this book, but this is a treasure trove of information that is not well understood. This is called The Wonderful World Within You. And what you're looking at the, on the right there, and let me ask a question. How many of you have ever seen Nutra Circles? Aha, well, I'm, this, is, this is worth you what, having me be like. <laughs> because this is the, this is the takeaway for having you endure. This is a powerful concept. I've, I've used this in my teachings now for, for 30 years, th this concept. So what you have, these nutri circles, uh, which Dr. Williams and Don Davis, who is an uh, associate, a good friend of mine, went to actually graduate school with me, what they uh, developed was this visual way of looking at nutritional density, or nutritional quality. So the, the circle at the periphery on the radial arms are all the essential nutrients. I call them the fabulous 50, right? The fabulous 50 essential nutrients. So you have the essential amino acids, like isoleucine, leucine, valine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and so forth. And then after that, you've got the minerals. And then after that, you've got the vitamins. And then you've got the fatty acids, right? So there's about 50 or so, I'm estimating, essential nutrients. Now, in the middle of this bullseye diagram, you'll notice that there is a, another circle, right? And that, can you see that other circle in the middle, like a bullseye? That is the circle that represents the amount of that nutrient defined by the Food Nutrition Board as DRDA. Okay? The radial arms that come out from the center then represent the amount in 100 grams of the edible portion of that food of that nutrient relative to the RDA. Can you see it immediately? Mm -hmm. So anything that goes on the other side of that, if you ate 100 grams of it, would be more than the RDA by the however long that line is. Anything put inside would not be the RDA. If even eating a quarter of a pound of it a day. Are we okay? Okay, so we immediately look up there at the top one, and what do you see? This was the average American diet. If we put everything, all the diet of people eat in the United States into a wearing blender, and we, you know, macerated it up, and we did a chemical analysis, that's what it would look like, just for your vitamin and mineral. I'm not about talking about fat protein or carbohydrate. And what do you immediately see? You immediately see there's a lot of stuff that we call nutrient gaps, right? Can you see that? That are not even meeting the RDA level. Now, you might question the RDA level, but let's not even go that far. Let's just talk about the RDA level itself. Can you see the gaps? So some things are high. Those are things that have been enriched. Some things are low. Those are things that have been taken out by processing. Are we okay? Now, the bottom one is interesting, right? What do you see immediately visually about the bottom one? You see the radial arms are really dense, right? You've got like a much higher nutrient density. And what is the bottom one? Commercial dog food. So my metaphor that I use is, now we know why we have tired pet owners and springy pets. <laughs> right? the, pets the pets get the quality of nutrition, the owners get the stuff that's left over. So it's a very interesting way of looking grammatically. By the way, you can download these. If you just go to Google and do Nitro Circles, these are all downloadable, and you can put them in your computer and use them if you want. So here's some examples of foods. And again, you can see in color, maybe it's a little bit more easily seen. Um, red are the ones that are not meeting the RDA. Blue are the ones that are exceeding the RDA. So up there, you've got the average American diet, and then dog food I just showed you. And then down below, you've got all-purpose enriched flour, and then whole wheat flour, right? So you can actually see the differences visually in comparing processed food to minimally processed food. Okay, so that's a concept of nutrient density that's Roger Williams' uh, concept as it relates to individuality. And this book was one that I used in my course that I taught at Evergreen, from which best year was born, I might add, um, back in 1978, Nutrition Against Disease. It's Dr. Williams' book that is still a classic if you read it today. I think it's a very, very powerful example of how these things fit together.